Good morning, church family. Very excited to be up here, as always. It feels like so long ago that I was just standing here. Um, ha. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be up here, and I'm excited to um, give this word to you that has been on my heart. And so um, before I get started, I'd like to pray with you. Dear God, thank you for your many blessings in our lives, for taking care of us, for um, warming this place so that we have a safe and warm place to meet together to worship you. And I just pray that you would be with all of us in this room during this message, that you'll open our hearts and you'll, you'll soften our hearts too to receive whatever it is that you have for us today. We thank you for everything you do. Amen. All right. I would like you to imagine a scene with me. And this isn't like a wonderful scene. This is kind of an intense scene. Imagine with me a married couple, and one spouse has been unfaithful to the other. Let's just say, for ease of explaining this, the husband's been unfaithful to the wife. And feeling extremely guilty for all of this, the husband decides, I am going to cook a beautiful homemade dinner, and I'm going to set the table with all our nicest stuff and just make a beautiful evening for my wife. So we've got the candles on the table that are lit, got the smooth jazz playing on the record player. You've got the fireplace glowing in the corner and this beautiful homemade meal. But to the husband's surprise, the wife gets home from work, hangs up her coat, sits down, eats the meal, and goes to bed without a word. See, the problem here is that the husband never actually apologized. Never actually apologized. And without a change in the faithfulness in their behavior, the sincerity behind a grand gesture like a beautiful dinner is kind of lost. The gesture essentially means nothing. And we run into the same storyline over and over again in movies and books, and it actually started way back in the Bible because Israel was known for being unfaithful to God over and over again. They're always looking for gestures to show how sorry they are, to make it up. They give these grand sacrifices. They do exactly as they're told, and then they mess up again. So God sends these prophets to ease the communication between the Israelites and God, because if you'll remember, they were a little too afraid to interact with God directly at the mountain. So they had these prophets that would intercede for them. And prophets are known to call out people for their mistakes against God, often rebuking Israel, in this case, for its unfaithfulness to God. And Micah is one of those prophets that we are looking at today, yet his collection of writings is sort of unique. If you read it from chapter 1 to chapter 7 all the way through, it can seem a little bit clunky, like it doesn't all go together, and that's kind of because it doesn't. <laughs> there are separate oracles that were put together under the same name because the same guy wrote them all. But Micah follows a common pattern in all of his oracles, and that is he exclaims this doom upon the people and then in turn offers hope for the people. And so in Micah 6, we notice this pattern, and I would invite you to open your Bibles with me because we're going to be going a couple different places, and it helps me at least to read it in front of me. But we notice this pattern in Micah 6 where God remarks what God has done for the people, starting in verse 3, he says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I sent you Moses to lead you. I redeemed you from the land of slavery. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal? that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. And on and on he goes, explaining these things. Look at all that I've done for you. And yet, Israel is unfaithful. And starting in verse 6 is a pretty common response from people, both in situations like my opening illustration and with Israel, where the humans start asking questions. Well, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Or maybe some calves, a year old? Or maybe that's not enough. Maybe God would be pleased with thousands of rams. Or if that's not enough, 
10,000 rivers of olive oil, as if we could do that. And then it reaches the highest possible sacrifice. Will the Lord be pleased with my firstborn offered for my transgression, the fruit of my very body for the sin of my soul? See, people are always thinking, okay, what can I do to fix this? Can I, can I give all my stuff? Does God want my stuff? But Micah provides hope in a clear phrase outlining exactly what God expects from people to demonstrate their faithfulness. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly or do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? But before we look any further, I have to add a little disclaimer because it can sound as if God is requiring certain actions in order for him to love us. And that's not the case. Everything that we explore from this point forward has to come from a place of understanding that there's nothing that can be done to increase or decrease God's love for you. It is always the same. And there's nothing that can be done to hasten or delay the second coming of Jesus. Rather, the actions that are described as required by God are the natural actions of those who are demonstrating faithfulness to God. So this sermon and this text is not going to give you the key for catching God's attention or getting God to love you more because that's already happened. God already loves you. But let's refer back to the questions from Micah 6, 6 through 7. With what shall I come before the Lord? Essentially, what can I give him to make up for my unfaithfulness? How shall we worship? Shall I bring God burnt offerings, rams, oil, my firstborn? But the answer to these questions is found in verse 8, with a collection of three actions, not things, not sacrifices, but actions that become hallmarks of faithful God followers. So in this sermon, we're going to look at the very first action, to do justice. But first, we have to understand a little bit about what justice might mean. A quick Google search would provide you with the following definition. Justice, in its broadest sense, is the concept that individuals are to be treated in a manner that is equitable and fair. Makes sense. And it seems right that God's first expectation for what people should do is concerning how we treat each other. Many, or I would argue most, monotheistic faith traditions, that is, those that worship a singular deity, emphasize the idea of justice. It's really important. For example, in a podcast I listened to briefly called The Rabbi's Husband, in Judaism, justice is described as actions that force us to see the humanity of others. And similarly, another evangelical pastor named Samuel Rodriguez says justice comes up from high to lift up those who are down low. Rather, justice doesn't come from an afflicted group but it comes from the unafflicted group to lift up those who cannot lift up themselves. But justice is also all over in our media, in our entertainment. For example, we've got the Justice League from DC Comics who are described as, and I quote, the greatest fighters for truth and justice the world has ever known. Or we have dystopian stories, books and movies like the Divergent series, that have a special faction of society in the story called Candor, and they are in charge of all the government stuff, all the court stuff, because supposedly in the story they cannot tell a lie. Honesty is a huge part of justice. And we have members of our Supreme Court in real life who make big decisions that alter the life of people who are called justices, and we've got justice movements in our communities. The meaning of this word justice is very rich. We think of similar words to be fairness, rightness, truthfulness, honesty. But it's all over the Bible, too. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, it appears in the original Hebrew language 422 times in the Old Testament. But what does it mean for God to ask of us or even demand or require that we do justice? Well, like I said, in the Old Testament, the word is translated from Hebrew, and the word is pronounced very badly by me, mishpat. And it's actually most commonly translated as judgment, not justice. 
But the uses of this word are drenched in meaning, ranging from fairness all the way to rightness and everything in between. And they all have the same idea in common. When any decision is made about a person or decisions are made that will affect a person or people, they carry a heavy responsibility to be made ethically and fairly, and that forces the decision maker to consider the humanity of all the affected groups. In the Old Testament, no decision was ever made lightly that considered or affected the livelihood of another person. But what about the New Testament? We get to the New Testament and suddenly we're in Greek, and the Greek word that's translated most often to justice or judgment is krisis. Kind of ironic, because it sounds like our English word crisis. And I would argue that a lot of times when judgments are made or justice is done, it can lead a person out of crisis and help someone to be relieved of a crisis. But what's interesting is in the New Testament, it's also most commonly translated as judgment rather than justice. Not in the judging sense, like I judge someone for what they wear, but judging in the sense that decisions are being made to produce an outcome that honors both parties. And most often, God is the one doing the judgment. And if we know anything about God, we know that God is love, we know that God is just, and so all the decisions he makes considers the humanity of all parties. But one of the best passages in the New Testament that I've found to understand what God's call to justice looks like is in Matthew 25. But I have to give you some context on how I came across this. Last December, I had the opportunity to go to a pastoral evangelism leadership conference, and it was really cool. I went as a guest. I wasn't a pastor yet. I was still a student. But basically, this conference is for pastors to come together to talk about what's working in their ministry, what's not working in their ministry, and goals that they can set together to strengthen their ministries. It's basically like a revival for pastors who are tired and weary. They all get together, they sing a lot of songs, and they talk about how to make their ministries better. It was really awesome. I was really blessed to be able to go. But because of that conference and sermons that I heard there, the idea of doing justice points me to Matthew 25. And we're pretty familiar with this text. I mean, it's the, the time when Jesus is talking about separating the sheep from the goats. And we love end time narratives. But let's read a little bit of this. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you looked after me, and when I was in prison, you came to visit me. But interestingly enough, the righteous respond and say, Lord, when in the world did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger? or needing clothes, or in prison, or sick. But the king responds, ever so gently, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. But we love these end time narratives because we think it gives us easy answers to get to where we wanna go, AKA heaven. But it's interesting that the things that Jesus is looking at in this hypothetical end of the world interaction is showing directly how connected our treatment of others and our treatment of God are. If God dwells, us, dwells in us, which we believe to be true, then it makes complete sense that how we treat others would be directly connected to how we treat God. Yet, it says nothing about what we do or don't do on Sabbath, the specifics of what we eat or don't eat, how much tithe we do or don't give, so then what are we supposed to do? What is the action that we are after? But just a couple chapters before Matthew 25, Jesus draws on the same point again. This is Matthew 23, verse 23, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. 
He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Interesting that it should be the exact same three things from Micah 6, 8. You should have done the former without neglecting the latter. Or I mixed that up, the latter and the former. But you got it. You're reading it with me. Jesus basically drops the mic. He shuts the curtain on the whole argument, saying that if all you're doing is focusing on the exact things that you were told to do, then you've completely missed the point. Focusing on what's allowed or not allowed instead of the people right in front of you in your community. So when we read Matthew 25, it's very common to jump to the idea of charity. And charity is awesome. But something that was discussed when I was at this conference for pastors, the difference between charity and justice was highlighted. You see, charity sometimes can function like a Band-Aid. It eases the symptoms of something greater that's causing it. And justice is about detecting the causes of the symptom or the need that requires our charity. Justice is making choices and fighting battles that uplift and celebrate the humanity of others. I was asked this question once, and I want to pose it to you because it really made me think. The question is, how do you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps if you don't have any boots? And the answer isn't just to give someone boots, because what if they've never had boots before in their life? They won't know how to tie them, wear them, let alone walk in them, or pull themselves up by the bootstraps. That person just doesn't have the tools. Charity is good, great even, but justice is what is required according to our text. Many of us here are very involved in a lot of charity efforts that are important and very needed. And I'm not saying that we should ever stop those. Like some of us give money to certain organizations or we help out at certain shelters and that's wonderful. But what if we took a little moment every week to think about what the source is for the problem that's requiring our charity? Is there anything that we can do? Are there people who are already doing this kind of work that we can link arms with? And at times, that may not be the case. It may not be possible. But let's refer back to Matthew 25. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. And when I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you looked after me. And when I was in prison, you came to visit me. And I know a lot of us can relate to those feelings of hunger or thirst or feeling like a stranger or any of these things. Because it's part of the human experience. But in every situation, the righteous here are looking for solutions. They're looking at people, and instead of seeing them as a problem or a need to fix, they see them as human. This reminds me of a really good friend of mine that I have who I think exemplifies the process of doing justice. And her name is Megan. She went to Greece, and this is like an extravagant example, but I have to share with you the story because it's so good. Um, but she went to Greece, and she lived near a refugee camp for three months, helping out there. And she helped with a program that was all about yoga and sports for the refugees. And rather than running the program and having the refugees come to these events, soccer games, yoga classes, etc., the refugees were the ones in charge of the program, and the volunteers were the ones coming to be part of it. So Megan went there for three months, and all that she was doing there, all it was about, was restoring dignity to these people in the refugee camps. Because I don't know how many of you know anything about refugee camps or if you've seen what it's like in one, but they're very dangerous. People become needs instead of humans, and it can become a very dangerous place for these people. They start to lose their concept of humanity because of the way that they're treated and the way that they treat each other. But these programs like the one that Megan was part of was all about restoring dignity to these people, making them feel like they're in charge of something and celebrating their humanity. So I guess the question that we're here with today is what will justice look like for us? 
And if you want me to tell you an exact answer, I really can't because it's different for everybody. But maybe it looks like educating yourself on where the injustices are in your community. Maybe you're ready to look into options to help with those areas. And maybe it's simply admitting to yourself that you could be part of an injustice that you didn't know about and learning how to confront that. But I can't emphasize enough how much this does not, cannot, and will never change the amount of love that God feels towards you, the timeliness of Jesus' second coming, or your salvation. The point is that our faithfulness includes doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. Considering the reality that God dwells, literally dwells within each and every one of us, even the people that we don't like, the ones we don't understand, or the people we don't get along with, even people we may have lost respect for. The task facing all of us here is to recognize the humanity in each other and to make fair and equitable decisions, to do justice. We may not end world hunger, solve homelessness, fix racism, sexism, or any other ism, but we can show others that they're worth trying for, and we can show Jesus that he's worth trying for. Doing justice is a demonstration of our faithfulness, and I hope that the Spirit would guide us to figure out what that looks like for us today. Amen. If you would stand with us, we'll sing our closing song. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus. 
Let's pray together before we go from here. Dear Heavenly God, thank you that we have the opportunity to look at each other and see a reflection of you. And thank you that you live in us and that you give us the opportunity to serve you in so many ways. We thank you for all that you do for us. And I pray that you send us from here with a heart full of love and a heart for service for you. I pray these things in your name. Amen.